Now we will begin part A with the first conversation. Number one. I was going to get something to eat at the cafeteria, but it seems to be closed. Oh, that's because it's Sunday. Why don't you come with me to a place I know on Canal Street? What does the woman suggest they do? Number two. How did your pictures of the orientation come out? Did you get them back from the Photoshop? Actually, the film's still in the camera. I haven't quite finished the roll. Why can't the woman see the pictures? Number three. Do you have a calculator that you could lend me for a few days? I just have no idea where mine is. Well, yes, I have one, but actually it's already on loan to someone. What does the man mean? Number four. I can't seem to wake up in the morning without coffee at breakfast. You know, I'm just like you, except I prefer tea. What does the man mean? Number five. If the weather doesn't get any better, we may have to scrap our plans for this afternoon's picnic. Don't give up yet. The forecast said the clouds should clear out by mid-morning. What does the man imply? Number six. Do you think I could borrow your car to go grocery shopping? The supermarkets outside the city are so much cheaper than the ones by the school, but they're so far away. I'd be happy to pick up anything you need. Well, I don't like to let anyone else drive my car. Tell you what. Why don't we go together? That way I can learn the way. What does the woman mean? Number seven. Do you mind if I take off my jacket? Of course not. Make yourself at home. What does the woman mean? Eight. I have to fill out these forms. They're due at the financial aid office by tomorrow afternoon. You were just complaining about how broke you are. If I were you, I'd make that my first priority. What does the woman mean? Number nine. My hand still hurts from falling on the ice yesterday. I wonder if I broke something. I'm no doctor, but it's not black and blue or anything. Maybe you just need to rest it for a few days. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number 10. Excuse me, do you have any apartments available for under $500 a month? I need to move in next week when my new job starts. The only vacant one I have is $600. Have you inquired at the apartment complex down the street? What does the man suggest the woman do? Number 11. You know, Sally was supposed to meet us here an hour ago. Maybe we should give her a ring. After all, she's the one who organized the study session. You're right. I'll do it. What will the man probably do? Number 12. 
Forgive the mess in here. You see, we had a party last night. <laughs> there were a lot of people. They all brought food, and the leftovers are all over the place. Yeah, I can tell. Well, I guess it's pretty obvious what you'll be doing most of today. What does the woman imply? Number 13. I'm worried about my jewelry business. I really thought I'd do better. At least you broke even. That's better than most people do in their first year. What can be inferred from the conversation? Number 14. I need to get in touch with Bill about tomorrow's presentation, but his phone's been busy for the longest time. I usually have dinner with him in the cafeteria. Why don't I ask him to give you a call later? What will the man probably do? Number 15. Care for some more dessert? There's plenty of cake left. If I had any more, I'd be overdoing it. What does the woman mean? Number 16. This scarf is nice, but Debbie really wanted a sweater for her birthday. I know, but I didn't know her size. What can be inferred from the conversation? Number 17. Think you'll be able to finish sketching out the plans for the election campaign by tomorrow, or do you need some help? Well, there's still quite a bit to do, but I'll be able to pull everything together. What does the woman mean? Number 18. About the concert tonight, it's unlikely I'll be able to pick you up before 7. Well, we could just get together there instead. What does the man suggest they do? Number 19. Uh-oh, I burnt your toast. I'll put in a couple more slices. No, don't waste the bread. Just scrape off the burnt part. It'll be fine. What does the woman mean? Number 20. Weren't you going to find out from the registrar if you have enough credits to graduate next semester? You're right. I'd better get over there. Their hours are limited and they can get pretty busy. What will the woman probably do? Go on to the next page. Number 21. I'm shocked that you managed to get an A on the test. You didn't even read the textbook. Now you know why I never miss a lecture. What does the woman imply? Number 22. That's an awfully heavy sweater for a day like today. Well, I'm going to be at a lecture in the auditorium most of this morning, and you know what the air conditioning's like in there. What does the man imply? Number 23. I think I'll get one of those new sweatshirts. You know, with a school emblem on both the front and back? You may regret it. They're expensive, and I've heard the printing really fades when you wash them. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number 
24. The concert set a record for attendance. I understand there wasn't an empty seat in the house. What can be inferred about the concert? Number 25. I really like those abstract paintings we saw in our history today. What did you think? I guess it's something I haven't acquired a taste for yet. What does the man mean? Number 26. I wonder if the entertainment committee has found a spot for the picnic yet. I just hope they pick a place near a lake this year. What does the woman imply? Number 27. What do you think of this gallery space? They've offered to let me exhibit some of my paintings here. Are you kidding? Any art student I know would die to have an exhibition here. What does the woman mean? Number 28. How much more should I boil these vegetables? The recipe says about 10 minutes total. They look pretty done to me. I doubt you'd want to cook them any more. What does the woman mean? Number 29. These shorts look a little too baggy, don't they? The shorts at all the stores we've been to fit like that. That's the style these days. What does the woman imply? Number 30. I love sailing on the lake. It's so refreshing to feel the wind in my hair and the water on my face. I guess I'd feel the same way if I could swim. What can be inferred about the man? This is the end of Part A. Go on to the next page. Read along as the directions for Part B are being read. Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 34. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Dr. Cole, thank you for agreeing to this interview for the Daily Campus News. Can you tell us about what you and your colleagues discussed at the annual Astronomy Society meeting last month? Yes. For the first time ever, the scientific community has established the existence of planets outside our own solar system. Of course, we knew that certain distant stars existed, but only recently did we learn that several of them are orbited by their own planets. Why did it take so long to locate those planets? Well, you have to understand that they are a billion times dimmer than their parent stars. It would be like trying to see the light of a candle next to a huge explosion. We don't currently have a telescope that can be used to see them. But if the astronomers didn't see the planets through a telescope, how did they find them? By a very indirect method. Um, the astronomers measured subtle distortions in the frequency of the light from the parent stars and observed that some of the stars seemed to rock back and forth. They determined that this was caused by the gravitational pull from orbiting planets. There's a powerful new telescope being built in Arizona. Will that help them see these planets? They should be able to see them at least in the form of small spots of light and then the scientists will be able to break down and analyze this light. By doing this, they hope to learn about the chemical composition of these planets. Oxygen and ozone molecules, for example, would be telltale signs of life on these planets. 
I'm looking forward to hearing more when the telescope is in operation, and I'm sure our readers will be interested too. Number 31. What is the purpose of the conversation? Number 32. What is the conversation mainly about? Number 33. How did scientists establish the existence of the planets? Number 34. What does the professor say the scientists might learn about the planets by using the new telescope? Questions 35 through 38. Listen to a conversation between two college students in a cafeteria. Is this table in the corner okay? Sure, we can sit here. Gee, you've hardly got anything on your tray. Yeah, I guess I'm just not that hungry. What's the matter? Aren't you feeling well? Well, I've been really worried. It's my car. It's in the shop again. Really? What's wrong this time? I don't know exactly. Something's wrong with the brakes, I think. Well, at least that shouldn't cost too much to fix. Parts are cheaper for old American cars like yours. Did the mechanic say how much it would cost? He said he'd call me with an estimate later on today. Now watch out he doesn't try to take advantage of you. What do you mean? Well, some car mechanics, if they think that someone doesn't know much about cars, they might try to overcharge that person. Maybe so, but I trust this guy. He was recommended by one of my neighbors. He's done some work for me in the past, and his prices seem to be reasonable. Well, that's good to know. Maybe I'll try using him in the future. Oh, by the way, do you need a ride home after class today? Oh, I'd sure appreciate it. It's really tough getting around without a car when you live off campus. Number 35. What does the woman imply about her car? Number 36. What does the man say about the woman's car? Number 37. What does the woman say about the mechanic? Number 38. What does the man offer to do? This is the end of Part B. Go on to the next page. Questions 39 through 42. Listen to part of a talk being given to a film class on a college campus. To get us started this semester, I'm going to spend the first two classes giving you background lectures about some basic cinematic concepts. Once you're a little more familiar with basic film terminology, we'll be ready to look at the history of movies in the United States. You'll be expected to attend showings of films on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock in Jennings Auditorium. That's our lab. Then during our Wednesday seminar, we'll discuss in depth the movie you saw the night before. We're not covering silent films in this course, so we'll begin with the first talking motion picture, The Jazz Singer, released in 1927. The next week, we'll be looking at The Gold Diggers of 1933, a piece that is very representative of the escapist trend in films released during the Depression. Some of the films we'll be watching will probably be new to you, like Frank Capra's Why We Fight, 
Others you might have already seen on TV, like Rebel Without a Cause, starring James Dean, or Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove. However, I hope you'll see even familiar films with new eyes. In the last three weeks of the course, we'll be watching films from the 1980s, and you'll choose one of them as the subject for an extensive written critique. We'll talk more about the requirements of the critique later in the semester. Number 39. What is the purpose of this talk? Number 40. What will the students study during the first two weeks of class? Number 41. Where will students view the films? Number 42. What will students do during each Wednesday seminar? Questions 43 through 47. Listen to a talk by a marine biologist in an aquarium. Welcome to our aquarium. As we begin our tour, the first animal we'll see today is the starfish. You probably have seen pictures of the starfish, but in a few minutes you'll see some live ones and learn a little about their structure and life cycle. First of all, starfish are not really fish. They belong to the family of echinoderms, which are spiny-skinned sea animals. That is, their skin is covered with thorny bumps. Most starfish have five arm-like extensions on their bodies, and so they look like a five-pointed star. But some other kinds have as many as 40 or more arms. Starfish, like other members of the echinoderm family, have what's called radial symmetry. All that means is that the body parts of these animals are arranged around the center kind of like spokes of a wheel around a hub. One of the special features of the starfish is that it can drop off arms as a defensive reaction to get away from an attacker, for example. They can then grow new arms to replace the old ones. Starfish reproduce by releasing eggs into the sea. These eggs develop into larvae and can swim freely. These early forms, which are what larvae are, differ from adult starfish because the larvae have bilateral symmetry. That means that the two halves of the larvae look exactly the same, which makes them look a lot different from the later form of the starfish. Eventually, the larvae sink to the ocean bottom and change into the adult radial form. If you don't have any questions, we'll go in now and see some of these creatures in person. Number 43. What is the talk mainly about? Number 44. What does the speaker say about the skin of echinoderms? Number 45. Why does the speaker give the example of the hub of a wheel surrounded by spokes? Number 46. What happens if a starfish loses an arm? Number 47. What is the major difference between newly developed and adult starfish? Questions 48 through 50. Listen to part of a talk in a United States history class. The professor is discussing the Civil War. Last time, we outlined how the Civil War finally got started. I want to talk today about the political management of the war on both sides, 
the North under Abraham Lincoln, and the South under Jefferson Davis. An important task for both of these presidents was to justify for their citizens just why the war was necessary. In 1861, on July 4th, Lincoln gave his first major speech in which he presented the northern reasons for the war. It was, he said, to preserve democracy. Lincoln suggested that this war was a noble crusade that would determine the future of democracy throughout the world. For him, the issue was whether or not this government of the people, by the people, could maintain its integrity, could it remain complete, and survive its domestic foes. In other words, could a few discontented individuals, and by that he meant those who led the Southern Rebellion, could they arbitrarily break up the government and put an end to free government on earth? The only way for the nation to survive was to crush the rebellion. At the time, he was hopeful that the war wouldn't last long and the slave owners would be put down forever. But he underestimated how difficult the war would be. It would be harder than any the Americans had fought before or since, largely because the North had to break the will of the Southern people, not just fight its armies. But Lincoln rallied Northerners to a deep commitment to the cause. They came to perceive the war as a kind of democratic crusade against Southern society. Number 48. What is the talk mainly about? Number 49. What does the speaker imply was the purpose of Lincoln's speech? Number 50. Who were the discontented individuals to whom Lincoln referred in his speech? <laughs> 